Tonight, why Homeland Security says to stop using Internet Explorer, Adobe's Flash also has a problem. Oh, and we're not done. Apple had a big security breach, too. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 75 for Monday, April 28th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash tn2. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash tn and the number two. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. So today, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Computer Emergency Readiness Team, I learned that was a thing today, said in an advisory that the vulnerability in version 6 to 11 of Internet Explorer could lead to the complete compromise of an affected system. The U.K. National Computer Emergency Response Team issued similar advice to Britain. Britainers, advising users to consider alternative browsers and to be sure that their antivirus software is current and regularly updated. The Internet Explorer bug was disclosed over the weekend by cybersecurity software maker FireEye Incorporated, which warned that hackers are exploiting the bug in a campaign dubbed Operation Clandestine Fox. This is the first and very likely not the last big threat since Microsoft stopped providing security updates for Windows XP earlier this month. Oh, but that's not all the security bad news. Researchers from antivirus provider Kaspersky Lab, Kaspersky Lab rather, have warned of a separate active campaign targeting a critical vulnerability in a fully patched version of Adobe's Flash Player. The attacks were hosted on the Syrian Ministry of Justice's website and were detected on seven computers located in Syria and exploited a previously unknown vulnerability in Flash when people used the Firefox browser to access a page that was a trap. Adobe has updated all three versions of Flash to fix the hole. People using IE 10 and 11 on Windows 8 and Chrome browser users will receive the update automatically, but Windows users running Firefox must run a separate update for both IE and the Mozilla browser. Security is just not having a good day today. Apple has patched a security breach discovered over the weekend that allowed access the personal contact information for every registered iOS, Mac, or Safari developer, plus every Apple retail and corporate employee, and some key partners through Apple's Developer Center. The company has not released a public statement on the bug, but did confirm to developer Jesse Jarvie, who discovered the bug, that it had been resolved. Okay, how about some good news now? Skype has made group video calling free for all Windows and Mac desktop users, along with Xbox One Live Gold subscribers. The feature was previously limited to Skype premium subscribers, so for $9.99 per month, the plan had access to group chatting, group screen sharing, live chat, customer support, unlimited phone calls to a single nation, and an advertising free experience. In light of the change, Microsoft has temporarily removed its Skype premium sign-up page in order to, quote, give it a refresh. At this point, it's not clear if Skype premium will come down in price or get more features. AT&T Chief Strategy Officer John Stank said in a statement that the company is planning an in-flight internet access business by building a new air-to-ground technology based on LTE, which would compete with existing airline internet participants, including GoGo and Global Eagle, whose Row 44 subsidiary powers Southwest's in-flight service. AT&T has announced pricing deals, not yet anyway, but said that it would be available for both commercial airlines and business jets upon on launch. AT&T also said that it, quote, does not expect additional capital expenditures required, required for this initiative to be material, nor will it have any impact on the company's previously announced financial guidance. I don't know why it took them so long then. Netflix just confirmed that it will pay Verizon for direct access through the carrier's network to allow improved streaming video for customers. The announcement follows a similar deal from earlier this year made by Netflix and Comcast and comes only days after the FCC announced new rules that would allow companies like Verizon to charge for preferential treatment. Coming up, the worst video game in history is unearthed from a landfill. Yeah, I'm going to tell you more about that. And up next, I'll chat with Dana Woolman from Engadget about advancements that Google has made with self-driving cars. But first, let's take a moment to thank lynda.com for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. 
want to start programming interactive objects with Arduino, perhaps, or enhance your images with Photoshop, or learn the basics of 3D printing, you might not know about any of that yet. Lynda.com offers thousands of online video courses in software, creative, business skills, across a wide variety of subjects. With a subscription, members receive unlimited access to the entire course library, the whole thing. Lynda.com works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day that new versions hit the market. So you always have the very latest skills. You're up to date. You learn from top experts. The courses are produced at very, very high quality. They're not homemade videos. They don't look cheap. They're good. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can learn at your own pace on your own terms. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire course library at lynda.com or for $37.50, you could subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven day trial. Visit lynda.com slash TN2 and access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses, all free for seven days. lynda.com slash TN2. All right, joining me now is Dana Woolman, managing editor over at Engadget. Hey, Dana. Hiya. How's it going? Good, thank you. Thanks for being here. So let's talk about these Google cars. Google just announced that their self-driving cars have clocked over 700,000 miles and are making their way onto city streets where previously this was pretty much just like a highway project, right? Right. Google announced that about a year ago it shifted its focus from highway driving to just regular streets, just because that's where people live. And it's also where they're spending a lot of time on the road. So now it's been accounting for all the sorts of obstacles we encounter on the road every day, whether it's um, bicyclists, um, uh, other drivers, pedestrians, um, things that seem unpredictable and a little bit scary to us sometimes, but that Google actually claims are quite predictable and easy to account for using big data and um, algorithms. Do you think that the company switched the focus? I mean, clearly there are a lot of people driving on the highway. I mean, commuting on, on, on highways is, is extremely common in lots of urban areas, but did they just think that there was going to be more interest from the type of people who do more urban driving? Um, I'm not sure about that. And I, there may have also been sort of a perception issue that I think as scary as some of these obstacles are to us as humans behind the wheel, um, that, that maybe this did seem like a problem that Google could solve, but maybe it occurred to Google that just without that road, um, that regular road experience, um, Google cars somehow wouldn't be as credible or wouldn't seem as safe. Um, I think Google is out to show that its, its cars can respond to these obstacles. And in fact, that there is a very systematic algorithmic way um, these cars can respond to um, these different situations. Um, but I think it really did need to show people um, that it is possible. So what types of objects or conditions can Google self-driving cars recognize that 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 they 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 didn't at the at the offset that that clocking in all of these uh, all these miles has really helped with? It's actually a really interesting variety of situations. So, for instance, if there's um, a set of train tracks, um, the self-driving car will not cross until it's absolutely sure that the train has passed. Um, if there's a cyclist maybe waving their arm to indicate that they're turning, um, it's going to give the cyclist right of way and let them get out of the way. Um, all sorts of examples like that involving everything from humans to other cars, as we said, to trains. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of objects that the cars that can recognize and then find a way to respond to. Google says they have 24 sensor loaded Lexus SUVs. Is there a certain type of car that Google seems to be going with that just makes more sense to be a self-driving car? Does the SUV make more sense just because it's bigger and, and at least there's a perception that you're safer on the inside if you're not actually under under your own command? Um, it didn't occur to me really that uh, any, did, the size of the car didn't occur to me so much as opposed to, let's say, a sedan. I did notice that it was Lexus. It is sort of a higher-end brand, and I will be curious to see how this technology one day plays into maybe more affordable cars because Joe Schmo isn't necessarily buying a Lexus as his new car. Some people are, and maybe the people who really care about tech um, and are fascinated by tech um, are interested in Lexuses, but it did occur to me more that um, this is a high-end brand and a luxury brand than it's a big car per se. Google says uh, the, the company, obviously they've put a lot of research into this. They have still a lot to figure out, but if you could try to predict when 
you and I could be in our own self-driving cars in our urban landscape. How far out are we? Um, this is just me spitballing here because obviously I think even by Google's own admission, the company needs to work on the technology a little bit more. It only switched from, it only switched its focus to road driving maybe a year, you know, within the past year. And even once it feels more confident in the technology, um, our regulators who focus on uh, transportation safety are going to have to take a close look at the technology. But if I'm just spitballing here, five years doesn't seem totally realistic, but um, 10 years seems a little more feasible. And again, that's just me spitballing. That's not um, me having any inside knowledge of the company's plans or, um, you know, what a review from, you know, government regulators would look like. Um, but uh, definitely in a few years, um, I think the company will have made some progress for sure. Do you have a terrible commute that would benefit from a self-driving car <laughs> 10 years from now if we actually get these uh, self-driving cars that, that, that we're hoping to get? I'm one of those New Yorkers who um, hasn't driven a car since I got my license. <laughs> um, and I got my license at... 21 later than most people just because I am a native New Yorker. So um, it doesn't mean I don't know. I'm, you know, I have been in cars. I've seen all these people and things pop out, but no, my commute is just okay on the subway. <laughs> Dana <laughs> Woolman, managing editor over at Engadget. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And tell folks where they can uh, read more of your work online. Uh, Engadget.com. Perfect. And Dana Woolman on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right. Yesterday, a Microsoft-backed documentary crew went to a landfill, stay with me here, in the desert town of Alamogordo, hopefully I'm saying that right, that's in New Mexico, to prove that Atari had buried thousands of copies of one of the most poorly received video games in history, E.T., the extraterrestrial cartridges were in fact uncovered. Now, we don't exactly know how many the team discovered, but Microsoft's Xbox Wire says, quote, we can safely report that those long buried cartridges are actually 100% there. The excavation will appear in an Xbox exclusive documentary produced by Fuel Entertainment, tentatively titled Atari Game Over. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. <laughs> Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News today, tomorrow, and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.